Tonight, the separation of church and school. The Supreme Court takes on a case of funding for religious education. We do not want to get into a situation where the state is going to pay for the teaching of religion. Plus, court packing the findings of a presidential commission on reforming the high court. And mandate blocked. A federal judge blocked the White House vaccine requirement for federal workers. This as Pfizer releases new data on booster shots to combat the Omicron variant. There is tremendous value compared to if you have only one or if you don't have any. Tremendous value. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. The Supreme Court takes on school choice. Good evening, I'm Jenna Browder. I'm John Jessup. Welcome to Faith Nation. Today, the nine justices of the highest court in the land heard oral arguments in a high-stakes case known as Carson v. Macon. It challenges a main law prohibiting parents from using a state student aid program to send their children to faith-based schools. Right now, the state offers tuition payments for students to attend private schools if they choose not to attend public schools. But faith-based schools do not qualify. The CB News Catholic Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson is following the case and joins us with the arguments. Abby? Well, Jenna, attorneys for the parents who want to use these payments to send their kids to faith-based school argue it's discriminatory and unfair, and they believe that they should be able to use the payments to send their children to the school of their choice. Religious schools, after all, teach religion. Yes, it is part of what they do. It is also part of who they are. Religious schools also teach secular subjects and satisfy every secular requirement to participate in the tuition assistance program. It is only because of religion that they are excluded. But the opposing side argued that Maine has determined public education should be religiously neutral, so faith-based schools should not qualify for this benefit. That is the benefit at issue here, a free public education. That private schools are sometimes enlisted to deliver the benefit is of no constitutional significance. States frequently outsource the delivery of public benefit programs, and that does not change the public nature of the program. Now, it's unclear when the Supreme Court will release its decision, but in two recent cases that are similar, the high court sided in favor of those arguing for religious schools to be included and qualify for public benefits. John, Jenna. All right, CBN's Abigail Robertson. Thank you so much, Abigail. Here with us now is Diana Thompson, an attorney with Beckett Law. Diana, thank you so much for making time for us tonight on Faith Nation. I guess first off, Diana, uh, how important is this case? And then secondly, can you tell which way the justices seem to be leaning on this one at today's oral arguments? This is an important case. The, the Supreme Court has said twice in the last five years uh, that government can't discriminate against religion in public programs just because it's religious. And Maine has not gotten the message. And so, and that's why we're back. This is a chance for the court to explain in a way that school districts, local governments, bureaucrats are gonna understand that you can't exclude religion from a program uh, when you offer it neutrally to across the board. Uh, the justices listened to the arguments on both sides today, and it did seem like uh, it's, you know, you can never know what, a justice, what the justices are going to do, but it did seem like they're going to rule in favor of the families who are asking for equal treatment in this case. Diana, is this a clear-cut case of separation between church and state, or is it deeper than that? Part of the problem in this case is this idea that separation of church and state means that you have to exclude religion from any, from ever coming near government. Uh, this is a situation where the government is saying we'll give money to families to send their kids to school and the and the, the families can choose where they want to go so it doesn't violate separation of church and state for the families to send their to send children to a private school a private school that's religious in fact it's part of the right of parents to choose how to direct the uh, the educational upbringing of their children and that includes if they want to send them to a religious school they have the right to do that Diana, can we zoom out a little bit? How important is the issue of school choice to religious schools that rely on some form of government funding? Well, across the board, you have religious schools, you know, 
doing great work across the country. They are they're offering you even Maine recognized the arguments today that they do an excellent job of educating children, uh, it, you know, on in even in secular subjects. And so if you have a program, you know, with that offers funding for private schools, you want to be able to include those programs to include the richest opportunities for children across the board. In your view, is there a constitutional argument to be made against allowing parents to use state funding to send their children to a religious school? Yeah, I don't think so. And I, Jenna, and I think the, you know, the argument behind that is just based on these old ideas of what it means for the, for, to establish a religion. Uh, the original, you know, the original idea was we don't want a government, a state religion, but including these schools in these neutral government programs doesn't do that. All right, Diana Thompson with Beckett Law. We thank you so much for your time and your insights tonight. Diana, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thanks for having me. Well, tonight, the long-awaited report from President Biden's Commission on Supreme Court Reform is out and notably taking no position on court packing. The president, who's expressed his own opposition to expanding the court, formed the commission back in April amid calls from Democrats to add more justices. Congressional Demo Democrats had called for expanding the court from 9 to 13 in an attempt to rebalance the makeup of the Marble Palace. The final draft of the report left out specific recommendations, instead offering a summary of arguments for and against issues from court packing to ju judicial term limits. The 34-member panel held six meetings calling on 44 witnesses in formulating the nearly 300-page report. And here with us now is Thomas Chipping, Senior Legal Fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Thomas, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, can you help us read the, between the lines here? Is taking no stance on court packing tantamount to rejecting the idea of court packing? Well, th this is an unusual commission in the sense that uh, the president did not ask for recommendations about anything. In fact, uh, the Heritage Foundation published a paper that I wrote earlier this year. I looked at dozens of commissions, not only on court reform, but on many other issues. I could not find a single commission uh, that was not given a specific problem to study and not asked to make any recommendations. So this commission didn't answer any questions. It didn't take any positions. It didn't make any recommendations. Uh, it simply reviewed and sort of summarized the debate over court reform ideas such as court packing or term limits. So uh, this commission is unique. I, I personally believe that that was deliberate. Um, the and, president, and, when he was a senator, opposed court packing. He didn't, uh, and, he, and he didn't endorse it when he was a candidate for president. I think this was his way of addressing court reform generally, but not taking a position in favor of court packing since most people expected the commission to do that Refusing to do it uh, really pours cold water on that idea. Now, of course, you know, one of, another no position issue came on term limits. Uh, Thomas, is there any case to be made for judicial term limits on the high court? Well, I think people ought to ask the question, if term limits is the solution, what is the problem? Um, you know, term limits as an idea, well, that's been talked about for probably close to 100 years. Uh, members of Congress have introduced constitutional amendments to, oppose, to impose term limits uh, going back to the 19th century. But the question is, since our Constitution allows judges to serve for life, which gives them a degree of independence, uh, what is the problem that requires that to be changed? And I don't know what the answer to that is. I've never heard anyone explain uh, what problem requires term limits for the solution. The issue is the kind of judges that a president appoints, not how long they serve. I worked on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate for 15 years. I saw how ugly the confirmation process can be. Term limits would mean over time more nominations, more confirmation fights. I don't think that's good for the Supreme Court. And I don't think it's good for the country. And they certainly do get very ugly. Thomas, for those on the side of the argument who support expansion of the justices on the, uh, of the court from nine justices, uh, what do you see? Would it lead to unintended consequences? Well, uh, there's only one reason to expand the Supreme Court, and it's the very reason that court packing should be rejected. And that is, 
It's an attempt to manipulate the decisions of the Supreme Court on certain key issues that are important to the far left. Uh, that would destroy the independence of the judicial branch, which is essential for the integrity of our judicial system. And uh, over time, uh, you know, you're going to have the temptation is going to be for the other party then to respond to decisions they don't like by changing the composition of the court. There's nothing wrong with the way the Supreme Court is structured today. They've had nine members since 1869. Uh, and there's no problem with how they're appointed other than the kind of ugly confirmation fights that we've sometimes seen in recent years. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But the, uh, there's no reason to rig the system in order to try to win all the time. And that's really what the left is trying to do with this. Hmm. What does this mean politically for President Biden and moderate Democrats? Does this report essentially give them cover from progressives who still insist on packing the court? Well, it, it, the, nothing has changed as a result of this report. The commission took six months, held six public meetings. My colleague, John Malcolm, at the Heritage Foundation was one of the witnesses before the commission. Uh, but the work of the commission, including this report, uh, and again, I think by design, does not add anything to the debate uh, about this, uh, about the issue of court packing specifically. The arguments are the same as they were before, and either there's going to be traction on that issue, Congress mm -hmm. will have mm -hmm. to get involved or not, but the commission really has not added anything to that. All right, Thomas Jipping with the Heritage Foundation. It's always good to have you. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Coming up, vaccine mandate blowback. What that means for the White House and new data about Pfizer's booster shot. Welcome back. Pfizer is now saying two doses of the COVID vaccine are not enough to fight the Omicron variant. And now, even as more and more doctors and public health officials strongly advise getting a booster shot, there's an increasingly heated debate over the president's vaccine mandate. As more and more people get their booster shots, the mandate battle is playing out in court. CBN's Bernie Carter is following the latest on COVID-19. Bernie GOP lawmakers are now fighting the mandate, saying it grossly exceeds the president's authority. John, Jenna, today Pfizer announced that a fourth COVID shot might be needed sooner than expected. This while another federal judge, this one in Georgia, said the Biden administration is overstepping its constitutional powers. Now GOP senators plan to vote on a resolution against the mandate, working to stop it once and for all. Economic shutdown. That's what's going to happen if this federal vaccine mandate enforced by OSHA goes forward. The highly politicized topic of vaccine mandates is becoming weaponized, only deepening the divide between party lines. The biggest thing standing between us and the end of the pandemic is Americans who have refused to get vaccinated. President Biden's absurd private sector vaccine mandate is blatant overreach. It is illegal. Lawsuits against the Biden administration are piling up. Since early November, federal judges have halted vaccine mandates for private businesses with 100 or more employees, for health care workers, and most recently for government contractors. I was part of the Pfizer trial. I'm pro-science, pro-vaccine, but I'm anti-mandate. A group of 40 senators wants to stop the federal vaccine mandate once and for all using the Congressional Review Act. If OSHA's ruling is disapproved, not only would it be nullified, the agency would be prevented from reissuing a similar mandate in the future, unless authorized by Congress. Anti-science, non-science, fictional belief comes from there. We ought not give it a stamp of approval in this chamber. But litigation is not stopping Americans from lining up in record numbers for boosters. The government says Omicron is spurring a million people per day to get a third shot. It's the highest rate since some adults were given the green light in September. Meantime, Pfizer's latest lab report shows two doses of the COVID vaccine may not be sufficient to protect against infection. Now advocating Americans to get a third shot for significant protection. If you get the booster, you're really in good shape. And so that's very encouraging news. There's more, that's the lab report. That's the lab report. There's more study going on. To rescind that mandate, senators need a simple majority. But even if it passes both the House and Senate, the president will need to approve it when a veto is more likely to come from the president's pen. John Jenna, back to you.
All right, Brody Carter, thank you. And joining us now, CB News Chief Political Analyst David Brody. David, politically speaking, does the blowback from this vaccine mandate hurt the president and Democrats? Let me think. Yes. Sorry, took me a while. Um, absolutely, it hurts the Democrats and the president uh, because this just in, it's a bit unconstitutional. Have you heard? At least the judges think that. Uh, look, uh, this has just been a disaster uh, for, for Democrats. Uh, and I can just kind of go through the numbers here. Uh, first of all, look at what happened in New Jersey. Why was that governor's race uh, so close? There was a, re a rebelling against the vaccine mandates. That's what the polling showed, that the, the folks in the suburbs were not going to have that. Uh, in Virginia, we had some of that as well. And of course, the polling among independents has been just abysmal for, for Biden and the vaccine mandates play into that. Look, we're not talking about the vaccine here. Please understand the difference. We're not talking about whether or not you should get the vaccine or not. We're talking about the, the question, Jenna and John, can I just be honest with you, just straight up with you? The, the question really is this in America. Will the vaccinated individuals in this country stand with the unvaccinated individuals when it comes to what, what the unvaccinated are calling medical tyranny? That's what it comes down to. Uh, and until that happens, I don't think we're going to, it's not going to matter for Biden. It's not going to matter for Republicans or Democrats. Uh, th th this is a liberty issue. And until the vaccinated stand with the unvaccinated, I don't think anything's going to change. Liberty and balancing that against public health, you just have this huge disarray with the country, huge division. David, moving mm -hmm. to Congressman Devin Nunes, uh, he's resigning from Congress, leaving to head up former President Trump's new media company. Uh, talk about the motivation for his decision there. I know a second ethics probe into Nunes uh, has been floated by House Democrats. Well, I think really what it is is that there's a redistricting. Go redistrict. I can't even say it. I, I'm a little tired. A uh, redistricting going on in his in his district. Uh, and so what would be kind of a plus 11, as they call it, in a Republican district is now could be a, even a plus five for Democrats. And, and so there's that issue there. Uh, but also, let's remember, I mean, we've seen this before. Jason Chavitz uh, from Utah, uh, former Republican congressman, left to go to the private sector, works for Fox News now. So, so this isn't too surprising in the sense that, wait for it, Devin Nunes can make a whole lot more money out in the private sector than being in Congress. So I think there's a couple issues here at play. Uh, late last night, David, the House voted to approve a bill setting up a process for lifting the debt limit. Do both parties come out of this unscathed or could a wrench still be thrown into the work uh, here you know, with just about a week left to go before we hit the debt yeah. ceiling? Yeah, no wrench. Uh, this, this will be passed. And both parties, I guess you could say, come out unscathed in the sense that I don't think people sit around and go, hey, honey, what's going on with the debt ceiling tonight? Unless it gets really crazy, uh, which, of course, we knew that it could have gotten uh, to be a real problematic issue. But we know, look, we know America is not going to default. And so therefore, uh, this this thing will, will continue on. David, also last night, the House passed a historic $768 billion defense bill with overwhelming mm -hmm. bipartisan support. Uh, does that mean this is a done deal? Done deal. Uh, it's a done deal. It'll pass in the Senate, no problem. Here's why. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for it, but let me just give you one, and it's a big one. Uh, Democrats wanted women to sign up for the draft. They wanted women to be, in essence, uh, part of the Selective Service Program. That has been dropped. And that's one of the big reasons why the bill passed. A lot of Democrats aren't happy about it, but oh well, it passed, and it'll move on to the Senate. If, if that had not passed, it would have been a lot more contentious. But uh, women will not have to sign up for the draft under this bill, and President Joe Biden will sign it. David, All right. a man in the know. Well, you'd be David, the first you. one to say that, but I appreciate it. I'll Venmo you. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> Checks in the mail. All right, thank you, David. And when we come back, the head of Instagram on the hill and in the hot seat facing tough questions over kids using the app. Well, welcome back. Bipartisan outrage among Beltway lawmakers today channeling their ire toward Instagram CEO and the harmful effect the app has on kids. The chief of the Facebook-owned addictive photo sharing platform was on the defensive over internal documents showing the app damages mental health and body image, especially among teen girls. Now I recognize that many in this room have deep reservations about our company, but I want to assure you that we do have the same goal. We all want teens to be safe online. The internet isn't going away, and I believe there's important work that we can do together.
Today's hearing, Instagram launched its Take a Break tool, encouraging users to stop after too much scrolling. Overseas tonight, as Russian forces continue to amass on the border with Ukraine, President Biden said he minced no words in a straightforward call yesterday with Russian leader Vladimir Putin. If in fact he invades Ukraine, there will be severe consequences, severe consequences, economic consequences like none he's ever seen or ever have been seen in terms of being imposed. He knows his immediate response was he understood that. And the president added that in addition to imposing sanctions against Russia, the U.S. would reinforce its military presence in NATO countries, as well as provide defensive capability to the Ukrainian military. Coming up, a miraculous box office hit, the Christmas movie that's breaking records and sharing the message that people must know. Next. Well, for many Christians, and especially Catholics, today marks the Feast of the Day of the Immaculate Conception, celebrating Mary, the mother of Jesus. This morning, the nation's second Catholic president took time out of his public schedule for worship, attending early morning Mass at Holy Trinity Church in the Georgetown neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Well, a new film told from the perspective of Christ's mother Mary is breaking records on the big screen. The Chosen series, which is free on the Chosen app, is quickly becoming a global phenomenon, viewed more than 374 million times in more than 190 countries across all seven continents. Wow, breaking records indeed. Now Christmas with the Chosen, The Messengers, is the best-selling and most highly attended movie in AMC's Fathom Events history. Don't be afraid. Jesus Christ is People must know. The feature film length Christmas episode debuted as number one at the box office on its first two nights and broke sale records for its distributor, Fathom Events. If you haven't seen it yet, not to worry. Christmas with the Chosen is extending through December 12th in theaters across the country. Jen, I know you're planning to head out and go see it. We, uh, we are. We're going tomorrow night. And I have to say, for anybody who's not seen The Chosen, the, the TV series on the app, it's wonderful. Highly recommend. Well, I think you've uh, sold me on it. I'm definitely going to check it out. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll see you today. again tomorrow.